Welcome all to the May meeting, the fourth Sunday. I think we've corrected it now, haven't we? Fourth Sunday noon meeting of the uh, Golden Gate Wing of the Commemorative Air Force. Um, this is an unusual weekend in that tomorrow, especially, many of us are going to be thinking, performing, traveling, dining, whatever, on what in essence is Memorial Day. So take that to heart. Our speaker today attended the last meeting when I was not able to come, and he probably has about as varied a career as anyone we've ever had speak. Born in Taft, California, raised in Havana, Cuba, lost his father at age 11, lied about his age, and I think I should, I think I should ask you, Wallace, is that the only lie you ever told? Yeah, okay. He lied about his age at age 16 and joined the Navy six months, seven months before uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. Served 20 years, electronic technician, communications, various things. And then when he got out, went to work for, among others, North American Aviation, which became North American Rockwell. And he became a uh, single engine land and a twin engine uh, commercial rated pilot, as well as a seaplane pilot. And uh, during some of the Apollo missions was uh, a test pilot for North American. Uh, I don't think he was testing the capsules or anything like that, but he was testing the Apollo astronauts on various phases of, you know, how to conduct themselves in the capsule. That's my guess, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say any more because I don't want to ruin his story. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Wallace Johnson, for living right here in Alameda. Thank you very much. And he will, he will donate this book that he's written called From One to Infinity with Synergy, The Life and Times of Wallace A. Johnson, MBA, MCEC. And he can tell you what MCEC means. Thanks. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. I would like to preface my remarks by thanking Larry and Gil and Ken and Steve and honoring me by asking me to speak to you folks on this occasion before the Memorial Day, which is so important to us all. First off, I would like for you to know I am not an astronaut, okay? People get confused because I said I was a test pilot for North American Aviation. I did not graduate from test pilot school at Patuxent River Naval Air Station, so I am not a Navy test pilot. I was a civilian test pilot. That was the designation they gave me when I hired on at North American in 19... <clears throat> 60 shortly after I retired from the Navy. My career of some 93 years has been one episode of being lucky from one situation to another all my life. I've been killed twice by students in airplanes. I've had an emergency landing I don't want to have another one. I went through World War II and buried an awful lot of my buddies. <laughs> and I have cancer, two forms, in case one's not enough for you, prostate, and a stage four melanoma, which is metastasized, the worst that you can have. When it was found, it was just a little eraser head on the top of my head. And in two weeks, it was 14 of them. By the time that we got the report back, my doctor said to me, you have a galloping type of melanoma. And I said, that doesn't sound so good. He says, it isn't. And I said, well, what's the bad news? He says, I give you six months unless we do something. And I said, well, what are you, you going to do? He says, normally I would just punch out the one individual cancer. 
but you have 14 of them and they're spread all over your head. So I'm gonna take your whole scalp off mm -hmm. because we've gotta keep it out of your lymph glands and we don't want it to go to your brain. And I said, well, if we do that, what's the good news? He said, well, you like to fish? I said, well, I'm ruined on fishing because I was up in Kodiak, Alaska where I married my wife of 47 and a half years before she expired in the, in the year 2000. And we threw them back if they didn't weigh at least 25 pounds. So that sort of ruins fishing for you. And I said, I don't think I wanna buy a, a fishing kit. And I said, well, here's the good news. I said, what's the good news? He says, I'll give you three years. I said, you gotta be kidding. Well, that's as bad as six months or th one year or whatever. I said, I, I don't believe that. He says, that's the way it is. Folks, it's been over nine years. I'm still here. I've had a guardian angel all my life. As I said, um, I go from one emergency to another, it seems. And somehow or another, I survive them all. I've always considered my wife to be my guardian angel, but I had one before then, even before I got married to her. And I still have a guardian angel, and I believe I give my credit to the current guardian angel, to the wife that I was married to for 47 and a half years. And I'll tell you a little modern day love story a little bit later on, as I make my presentation to you. But you know, they say, if you're gonna tell a story, start at the beginning. So let's start at the beginning. I'm one of those rare animals who lives in California who was actually born here. What do you think of that? That's a rarity. I was born in Taft, California. It's oil country down by Bakersfield. My father was the superintendent of the oil refinery in Beloit, Havana, Cuba, Standard Oil. When my mother got pregnant with me, he decided that he wanted me uh, to be born in the States, even though we all know that if you are born to an American citizen, you're automatically a citizen no matter where you are in the world. But he knew that my mother had some health problems, so he brought her to the States, and I was born in Taft on, June, on April the 18th, 1925. But before I was six months old, we were back in Havana, Cuba, living on the refinery grounds of Standard Oil. Now, those of you that are history buffs probably remember that in 1932, they had a revolution in Cuba. Revolutions in these countries such as Cuba are things that are consistently going on, as you well know. <clears throat> and we had soldiers bivouacked in our front lawn and my father didn't want his children and his family exposed to this type of thing. There was all kinds of bad things going on. The soldiers were there to ensure Standard Oil that nobody would bother the U U.S. government property that belonged to Standard Oil. But it was still a thing that my father didn't want to put up with. So he requested that he be sent back to Houston, Texas, where he originally started with Standard Oil. So I matriculated through the school system. From 1932, went to school, <clears throat> not speaking English. I only spoke Spanish. My mother would speak to me in Spanish. She was of, Sp of Spanish extra extraction. She was from Spain, although she was born in Cuba. Her family were Spanish. And <clears throat> I spoke Spanish all the way around, but I understood English. I didn't speak it too much. But by the time I got, got to the third grade in Spanish speaking school was the time to come back to the country in Houston. And I started in, in the first grade. Believe it or not, I was in the third grade before the end of the year because I picked up my English real fast. 
real fast. My father would speak to me in English, and I would answer in Spanish. So the transition from Spanish to English was very simple for me. And that was the education that I got. And I matriculated through the school system in Houston, Texas, was in the 10th grade in San Jacinto High School, which we called the tea sippers in Houston. In Houston, you had to go to a school depending upon what ward you were in. Now, the school that I originally started in when I went into high school was Sam Houston High. It was in the center of town, not unlike uh, uh, Alameda High here in Alameda. But San Jacinto High was a ward that more or less catered to the middle income class, upper, higher, higher income, and their kids were exposed to a better environment than those of us that had to go to Sam Houston High. My mother unfortunately moved. Just a matter of going from one side of the, of the, of the street to the other side of the street, put her into the proper ward where I had to go to San Jacinto. So I transferred to San Jacinto. Now San Jacinto, the kids wore seersucker slacks, brand new huaraches. They had, some of them, cars. Believe it or not, driving a car. Can you imagine that? Driving a car in 1939? 1940 to school and I immediately fit in re real well in that I belonged to the debating society I was on the school newspaper and I was in the school orchestra I fit in real fast but working for Western Union and making 12 cents an hour didn't give you much chance to accumulate much money and it was always the case that I was invited to go to Princess how many of you ever heard of Princess the drive-in where girls would come in with little bitty short skirts up to here and they were in roller skates and they would roller skate out to your car and then they would put a tray on the side of the of the door remember that and you would get a hamburger big big hamburger for 10 cents and that included potato chips and a mall believe it or not with two scoops was 10 cents now I had a choice I could have a malt or I could have a hamburger, but I couldn't have both because I didn't have that kind of money. But I always got a malt and I always got a hamburger because one of my buddies would see to it. That put me in a real peculiar position. Imagine, here I am 16 years old. I'm making 12 cents an hour with Western Union. I have my own paper route on top of that, which by the way is what made me very socially conscious. I've been very socially conscious from the time that I was cognizant of the fact that we had soldiers bivouacked in our front lawn as a child in Havana, Cuba. But I was very socially conscious because I used to hawk extras. How many of you remember the extras? Anything that would happen in Europe, boom, the newspapers would stop the presses and they would come out with an extra and the extra would have great big headlines across the front. Hitler invades Sudetenland. How many of you remember that? And all of the alphabetism that went on in World War, I mean in uh, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration. The CCCs, the WPAs, and all the alphabetism that goes on with all these bureaucratic things that Franklin Delano Roosevelt trying to set, set up and get going when he had the New Deal, trying to get uh, overcome the, the scourge of the bad depression that we were experiencing by pump priming. In any extent, how many of you remember the stacking of the Supreme Court, where Roosevelt tried to stack the Supreme Court because he was having so much opposition to his New Deal concepts that he figured, well, if I can get more people into the Supreme Court to think like I do, I can get some of these laws passed. It was found unconstitutional, and he wasn't successful at it. 
But all this time, I was reading the newspapers because I had to know what the headline was all about. And believe me, we had headlines coming out two and three times a day in some cases. History was being made in Europe day after day. As those of you who keep track and were around at that time can easily remember. And I was involved in the sense that I knew what was going on around me, even though I was only 15, 16 years old. But I couldn't keep up with the tea sippers. And I came home one day <clears throat> realizing I'm unhappy. I can't m mooch anymore. I've, I've, got, I've got to do it on my own. So what's the answer? The answer is join the military. Join the military. So I went to the recruiter and I said, I want to join the military. Okay. Now they knew I wasn't 17 years old. <laughs> they could see the way I was dressed and the way that, uh, I, you know, I, I, my physique, I was underweight, I was malnourished. They knew that I wasn't 16 years old, but they went along with me. They said, well, for your size, you gotta weigh 111 pounds, kid. If you can weigh 111 pounds, you're in. I got on the scale and I missed it by a pound. I weighed 110. And he said, I'm sorry, kiddo, you can't come into the Navy. I said, but if I weigh 111, I can get into the Navy? He was on safe ground, sure, all you have to do is come back six months from now, you'll weigh 111, and we'll let you into the Navy. Now this is before World War II, remember, this is September 1941. On the way to school and to the recruiting office, I always passed a farmer's market. And a thought hit me. I said, I got it. I got it figured out. I bought myself two pounds of bananas. <laughs> and I proceeded to eat those bananas. Now, you would normally think that I would hate bananas. Ask my friend Vicki here. She'll tell you, I love bananas to this day. So I put those bananas in me somehow. And in short order, I was back at the recruiting station in the same clothes only a couple hours later. And they didn't know what I was up to, but they knew that I hadn't done anything any different. I didn't put rocks in my pocket or anything like that. I said, I wanna be weighed again. You told me if I weighed 111, I'm in. They didn't figure I'd weigh 111, and nothing different about me, same attire, same clothing, everything the same. I got on the scale and I weighed just over 111 pounds. I said, you're gonna keep your promise, being an officer and a gentleman. The recruiting officer, who was, a, who was a Lieutenant JG at the time, I remember, said, you're in, kid, you're in the Navy. And on September the 30th of that month, I held my hand up and everybody thought I was 17. That's what I call the banana caper. <laughs> and it's an article I write, I wrote, it's in the book that I have. I found it interesting. Let's give you, give you a little bit more about what I did then. It's war, World War II started shortly thereafter, as you well know. I knew it was coming and I was only 16 years old. My mother didn't want me to go into the Navy, but I got on my hands and knees and I begged her. I said, mother, mother I, can't, I can't live the existence that I'm living now as a student. I've got to join the Navy. I literally got on my knees and I begged my mother, please let me join the Navy. Being a good mother, she thought that she was sending me to my death because she knew, she knew that we were going into war shortly. But she signed the papers. She signed the papers because they said, you can't get in unless you have a piece of paper from your mother that says you're 17. They knew that I had written the doggone note to begin with, but I was in. 
I was in San Diego Naval Training Center when World War II started. All of a sudden they got us all together and they put us in buses and we were headed towards Tijuana. We didn't have any weapons. I don't know what they were doing. I don't think anybody knew what they were doing. I believe it was just an exercise to see if somebody tells us to send a whole bunch of people someplace real fast, can we do it? And I think that was the exercise. Can we get buses together and can we throw all these recruits who don't know their you know what from a from hole in the ground? No weapons. Can we respond? And we did. We headed towards Tijuana, got halfway down there and then turned around and came back. That was World War II starting for me. I had taken tests and the Navy determined that I was somewhat intelligent, so they sent me to communication school in Chicago, Illinois, at the University of Chicago. Signals, communications. I went from there to Philadelphia, and I was assigned to the world's largest yacht. First, it was the USS Jamestown. Those of you that know anything about Navy know that cruisers are named after cities. So I thought, boy, this is fantastic. I'm going to a cruiser. I did my best to get on a battleship. Thank God I didn't make out on that one. But a cruiser's okay. Only to find out it was the world's largest yacht. It was so large and the people were so well off. They were the builders of the, of the Brooklyn Bridge that the people had a gyro system actually installed in the bowels of the ship so that as she would labor at sea, there was no rolling or any pitching. She just cut her way through the water. But when she was sold for a dollar to be converted to a motor torpedo boat tender, a PT boat, they took that gyro out, an enormous amount of weight and the ship ended up top heavy. And I only mention that because you would be surprised how often we labored at sea wondering whether we were going to survive because she had a rolling and pitching motion. She would slowly roll to the right and with the starboard pitch, she would sit there and think about it and shake like this before she would respond and then upright and go back to the port side, over to the extreme there and shake, and then make up its mind that she wasn't going to sink. I mention this only because when I put her out of commission, right here at Richmond, she was sold to an organization that was plying the islands, the Bahama areas, and she got caught at sea in a heavy squall, and she turned turtle and sunk. So she was top heavy. We even put radar gear on her and put all kinds of stuff in the mass that made it top heavy. But she was a motor torpedo boat tender. And I'm sure all of you have heard of 109, PT-109, Kennedy's boat. She was the mothership of three squadron, 36 boats. The war started and turned around when we made the landing on August the 7th, 1942 in Guadalcanal. We had come up from Manus, the British, <coughs> the uh, French uh, Fiji Islands, Suba, and up to Guadalcanal, and we made the landings with the 7th, 7th uh, Marine Division under General Vandegrift. The PT boats were designated to go to Tulagi, which was across what we now call Iron Bottom Bay. And we call it that because there were so many ships sunk during the time that we were trying to take the, Jap the, the island away from the Japanese that we call it Iron Bottom Bay. Many battles were fought there, but we went to Tulagi and we took the ship up a river, the Malialai River, and literally ran it aground. We got up as far up as we could. And then we had foliage cut and we completely camouflaged the ship, ship by completely covering it over. And we did that while all these battles were taking on by the Navy fleet 
taking on the transports that were trying to resupply Guadalcanal, we were supposedly safe in Tulagi because we were completely covered over. And washing machine Charlie would come over every night and we could hear him up there looking around. He knew that there was a tender there somewhere that was tending these PT boats. And he was trying to find us, but we never opened fire on him. They would bomb the harbor and come up the river and fly right over us, right over us, 100 feet above us and not even see us. Never fired on them. And I mention that only because we were given orders to go back to the States during the war. And we were relieved by the USS Niagara. And we, we had a meeting with those people and told them, you're going to have aircraft coming up the river. Don't ever fire on them. Don't ever fire on them. Just let them go. They won't see you. You'll be completely covered over and they'll not bother you. We were on the way back to the States, heading for Suva, when we got word that the U.S. Ni Niagara opened fire on the first airplane they saw and she was sunk on the spot. And guess what? We got orders, go back. Thank you, USS Niagara, for not paying attention. We went back and then we started the island hopping routine and we went through one island to another. We would skip islands. We would go from Rendova to Bougainville. We would skip islands and literally hope that the Japanese would either surrender or starve them to death. So we went all the way up to the northern parts of the, the chain and then the atomic bomb was dropped. And as you know, the war was over shortly after that. I have an episode of an occurrence that I'm real proud of. We were in Borneo, north of Borneo. And it was in the middle of the night. And it's entitled, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. I'm sure that you've heard that term in English. People who speak about prose and the proper starting of a sentence always make fun of the fact that this particular author is known because his start first line is, it was a, star, a, 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 it was a dark and stormy night. Well, I start my story the same way, but I emphasize by making was in capital letters because it was a dark and stormy night. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes a, an airplane flying right over the ship. And we realized it's dark out there low overcast, we've got a problem, this, pla this plane's in trouble. So we realized, trying to communicate with the B-25, that we had lost the inability to communicate with radio. So the only thing that left available to us was visual means. There isn't a pilot that goes through flight training, as you well know, that doesn't remember or, does, or can't remember the fact that you had to learn the Morse code. I can assure you the pilot of that particular B-25 and the radio man that was aboard was watching my Aldous light, which is a gun about so long, three inches in diameter, which has a strong light on it, but if you're very accurate as to who you point it to, only the person that you point it to is going to see the flashing light. And I was instructed by the captain, tell that B-25, the magnetic heading to Zamboanga. Remember the song, oh, the monkeys have no tails in Zamboanga. Well, that was the Zamboanga. That was the nearest Air Force base. And we gave him that magnetic heading over and over and over again. All he did was just go around and around. Then the captain realized, I've got to make sure that he understands what I'm trying to tell him. So he turned the ship all the way out 360 degrees and took up the heading of Zamboanga. And the last we saw of this B-25, he was coming right over us on our heading and we knew he got the word. We lost track of him, he went into the dark and we, for two days we wondered, I wonder if they made it. And we were in port in Borneo when one day at noon we were having lunch, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes a B-25 
And man, that son of a gun was buzzing the devil out of us. I mean, he, would, he was only three feet above us when he went past us. And we knew it was that B-25. And we got a message from the port of Zamboanga and all that information is in my book as a story where I was given a little bit of notoriety by giving a, a little letter that came from the port of Zamboanga where the pilot, a Lieutenant Fitzgerald, was thanking the USS Jamestown because we saved their crew. I did my best to get a hold of him after World War II, but he had passed on and I could only communicate with his son. And I had the pleasure of getting to know him quite well because he, he sort of felt I wouldn't be here were it not for s some little effort that you put into this thing. And so that gives me a good feeling. I have a lot of stuff that I could tell you about my, my uh, experience in the military. I've broken the book up into four sections. The early years, which is a, the Depression years before I went to the Navy, Cuba and that experience. And then the FDR years and the Depression. How many of you pick cotton? Any of you pick cotton? Well, kids, I have. <laughs> and it's, it's not any fun. I pick cotton with my mother. My father passed away when I was 11. I have a little article in my book about the passing of my father and taking the blame. That's not uncommon, by the way. Kids, for some reason or another, when their mother or their father passes away, they think they're responsible for it. Kids being kids know that they've been bad at times. And if it's only because they were chastised and be corrected, that was enough of a reason. That's why he died. So I had a little article on that and how important it is to realize what's going on when this tragedy is taking place in the family and what it does to the kids. I went on ahead and went from the Navy, decided that I should go because I had an interest in electronics to the electronics school. The Navy had a program where we were short of technicians and they had a program where you could actually transfer your rate from one rate to a chief electronics technician if you were a chief quartermaster, as an example, which I was at that time. I had become a chief petty officer and I was pushing boots in, I pushed four boots through boot camp training in the very place where I graduated from when I joined the Navy, right there in San Diego. But by that time, I had bought an airplane. This is 1946, 1947, 1948. And I had a little thing going, DWAJ, which stood for Doris Elizabeth and Wallace A. Johnson Flying Service. And I had my own little airplane and I had by then gotten my commercial license at Friedkin School of Aeronautics. I was a certified flight instructor. I got my commercial rating as, a, as you have already been told, my multi-engine rating, my seaplane rating, my ground instructor's rating. And all of my life, education has been most important to me. So I've always been trying to learn better myself the end result was that the Navy knew that I was an amateur radioman. I decided I wanted to be an amateur radioman. And so I took the exam and the license and I had a little bit of knowledge about electronics and I knew the Morse code and all that. So they sent me to electronics school. And that was a year program where they concentrated on giving you the necessary information to make you a, an electronics technician which was a four-year double E knowledge, a double E course in college, minus the English and minus the humanities and minus this and minus that. Math and electronics, math and electronics. It lasted for a year with 10 days off for vacation one time. 
Every week we had to take an exam. If you fail the exam on Friday, you did the class over, you got one chance. There were 111 of us when we started, and when I graduated, there were only 11 of us left. My orders were report to the USS Hornet, CVA-12, small world. It's sitting right here as a museum right now. I reported aboard as the chief electronics technician in the communications department of the Hornet. And I told the people, sorry to tell you this folks, but I'm not gonna be here very long. Because they didn't know that I had been told by the Navy that they wanted me to go back to the electronics school as an instructor. So I was on the Hornet, and how many of you know what, a, what an anchor pool is? An anchor pool is that very moment by international law when a ship which is at sea under international law throws the first hawser, a rope, a line, manila line, first hawser and it's attached to the deck and anything that happens from that moment on pertains to inland international laws. And you, you, it's a shift of one condition to another legally and you are docked. And so we have a pool and you pay a buck for, for a number, basically the hour and the minute. And it, it, for every hour and every minute, I took a thing out and guess what guys? I won the pool. So not only did I win the pool, but I'm telling these people that I just got aboard, which I picked up in Hong Kong, by the way, that I'm going to leave. Said, you just got here. From shore duty, you was in electronics school. You can't come back to sea. I mean, you can't leave sea. You gotta have some sea duty before you're eligible to go back to sea, back to, uh, to land base assignment. And they didn't know I was going back to as an instructor. So I went back to electronic school and I taught for three years. During that time period, I worked at Waukegan's flying service as a flight instructor. I've all, no matter where I was, I've been flying. I had an airplane then, I bought another airplane. And so I've always been keeping up with my flying and bettering myself. I got two years of college out of the way while I was in the military. That was through Armed Forces Institute out of Wisconsin. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that because I was trying to get into the flight program. I wanted to be what we had in the Navy at one time, an AP, which is an, an enlisted pilot. I qualified for that, but I had to have two years. So I got myself the two years. I took all the necessary courses, took the exam, and was given credit for two years equivalency of college work by the Navy. And I qualified for the program only to find that about the time that I was ready to put in for a request to go to AP school, they inc increased the requirements to four years of college. So I missed out on flight training as far as the military is concerned. Never went to flight training in the military. That's all I ever wanted to do. But I was trying to make up the difference on my own. I then went to electronic school and it's 1960 and it's time to retire. I am now 36 years old and I'm retired. I'm an amateur radioman, knowledgeable in communications, knowledgeable in navigation, because while I was a chief quartermaster, I was the old man captain. I was his assistant navigator. He taught me how to take the noon sun, the early morning stars, how to work a sextant. I had my own sextant. And so I was, in a sense, a junior navigator. And it's real funny. He would compare his sights with mine. And the fact of determining your position at sea is not so much finding out where you're at, but making an estimate of where you think you are and then proving that you're not there. That's what navigation at sea is. And so you correct the mistake that you made by saying I'm here and then you take your sights and find out you're really here. 
and then you go that from that point on to the next point and do your navigation on as you go across the oceans wherever your destination is so i graduated from electronic school with a lot of background i had communications background i had navigation background and i sent out 300 resumes and i got 25 solid offers to go to work by then, I had about 6,000 hours of flight time, believe it or not. About 6,000 hours of flight time, including the seaplane rating, which not too many people had. I was a certified flight instructor, which not too many people had. But in any extent, I'm one of those rare birds that took advantage of the GI Bill of Rights, the biggest, biggest, most beautiful program that you could ever have educating our people because that's where our future lies in how you educate these youngsters that are out here right now who are going to run the show 50 years from now long after you and i are gone no matter how you get the education to them and i'm i'm of the opinion that if you have the ability to matriculate through a phd program that it shouldn't cost you a cent. The taxpayers should pay for it. The Scandinavians do. They're smart enough to see to it. If you've got the brains to do it, it's to our advantage to see to it that you get an education. In fact, they will pay you to go to school. It's being done by more than one country. And the sooner we start that in this country, the better off we're going to be because our future lies in how we educate our kids. For me, education was a constant goal. So when I sent out my resumes, as I said, I got about 25 good, good answers. A lot of them were, you have an interesting background, but we have you on record, and if we need you, we'll let you know. I'm sure you've seen those letters many times, but I did get one very important one from North American Aviation. They wanted me to come aboard because <clears throat> of my flying background, my electronics background, and they wanted to send me to their school on inertial navigation systems. North American Aviation had a system aboard the B-52 called the Verdan computer, which controlled the inertial navigation system. I went through their school it was a nine-month course that they were willing to invest in me to become what they considered a top-notch expert in their system. And they contracted my body with Curtis LeMay, who was the general of the Strategic Air Command, flying out of Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi, under command of the Strategic Air Command. And I flew in B-52s, instructing the, in, the navigator aboard the B-52s how to program the missile of the inertial navigation system that was in the Hound Dog missile that hung underneath the wing of the B-52. And I did that for 18 months. All of a sudden, it's 1962, and North American Aviation wanted to get into the space program and they won the Apollo program. Out of all the people that were trying to get that program, North American Aviation in Downey, California won. The minute I heard about that, I put in for vacation. I flew out to the West Coast and I made it my business to contact certain people, one in particular who was a PhD by the name of Canby. And I said, Dr. Canby, I wanna be in this program. And he says, well, <clears throat> We're in human factors, human engineering, and we need someone that has pilot experience, who knows inertial navigation systems, who knows electronics. So I'm going to ask that you be transferred back to the plant. And so they did. And I got involved in 1962. I came back to the Apollo. Now, again, as I told you, the book is broken up into four sections. I've gone through the early years, 
the Depression years, and I talk about it, the military years, and I talk about it, and then I mentioned a couple of things about the Apollo. Let's talk about the Apollo, the Apollo program. The little telephone that I have right here has 1,000 times more capability than the inertial navigation system, computer system, that we had in the B-52s, believe it or not. There's more knowledge and more sophisticated electronics with regards to sophisticated stuff in your TV than you can imagine what we had in the 1962s. But we won that contract and our job was as the astronauts were chosen and assigned to their specific spacecraft to matriculate with them through the system. Keeping in mind that as pilot subjects and pilot test pilots for North American Aviation, in-house pilots, we had to keep up with that crazy configuration called the panel that was constantly being changed. They would put a switch over here and would remember that one for an emergency condition and only to find that they had changed it over here. Why? Because the astronauts, when they came through, said, no, I don't want it over here. I want it over here. And for whatever reason, human factors would get involved and they were constantly changing this spacecraft. It was our job to keep up with the changes because it was our job to pass this information on to the respective crews that were going to be assigned to that one particular platform, the Apollo craft. I did that for 10 years. I was responsible for writing the reentry studies. I think I have more hours in the simulator flying the reentry Apollo mission reentry, making absolutely sure you don't come in too shallow because you'll skip out into space if you do, or come in too sharp because you'll penetrate and burn up if you do. And we had to learn what are the techniques that we have to pass on to the astronauts so that they can make a reentry uh, successful one. And I believe I'm the, I probably have more hours in that simulator. And the end result was a technique. Keeping in mind that if you look at the Apollo spacecraft, it's not an asymmetrical object. It, it looks like a cone. It's got an apex. You know the shape of it. It comes, comes in bass backwards, which everybody thinks it's going to come in with a point coming in. It's turned around. It's the, the ablative heat shield is at the bottom of the spacecraft. But you've got to place that son of a gun in the proper position, keeping in mind that when you yaw with the stick that you control yaw with, there is a cross-coupling effect that affects roll. Or if you roll, it affects y'all. So you had to learn, you had to learn if that you were trying to get into a particular attitude, you had to remember this cross coupling that would take place. And it wasn't an easy thing to do. Now I flew a rendezvous and docking mission in Toledo, Ohio. We leased one of their facilities because they were working as a subcontractor. And I flew alongside of Wally Shira. And the job was to leave the, the service module, separate from the Apollo, pitch, roll, and then come back and dock. Okay, there's a certain technique that we were trying to learn. We were trying to learn how much time does it take? How much fuel does it take? And just exactly how can we take care of this cross-coupling effect that we had even in the limb? So the end result was I flew against Wally Shira and I beat him hands down. Well, obviously I had all kinds of hours doing this thing over and over and over again. And this was the first time he ever saw it. So naturally I beat him. And I have the records at home that I'm real proud of because it says test pilot Wallace Johnson, test pilot NASA, Wally Shira. And it was one of the highlights of that particular study. I could tell you all kinds of things that aren't even published that people don't know about. 
I could, I, I could tell you, it would make your hair stand on end, some of the things that happened. But the end result was, we got the guys on the moon. And believe it or not, I really didn't think we were gonna make it. And if you remember and watch the Armstrong actual landing of Apollo 11, it was only a, a matter of about 15 or 20 seconds of fuel that he had left. If he hadn't done it, if he hadn't done what he did, or he had used up past that point, he would not have been able to leave the moon and get back to dock with the Apollo. And he only missed it by 20, about 20 seconds is all he had left. But the man was a test pilot of test pilots. Very unassuming, not a glory, glory seeker like some of them were or are, and went back to academics, living a quiet life, devoting his life to students, trying to pass on knowledge because he knew that's where it was. But a very exacting, intelligent, very, very subdued, quiet, unassuming man. All of them are gone now. And I read in this morning's paper that Al Bean, fourth man on the moon, died Saturday. I think he was 82 or 86, I can't remember. They're all gone. I have a book here that's got about 60 astronaut signatures in it. And all of the seven that were on the Apollo all signed my book on two different areas. I'm very proud of it. It's my legacy to my family. It's gonna be worth some money if they, if they keep a hold of it long enough. But all of them are gone now. Let's talk about Apollo tragedies. We've seen the tragedies that have taken place with, the, uh, with various space programs. The worst experience I've had in my life has been associated with death, starting with my grandmother in Havana, Cuba. She was very dear to me, and I experienced that when I was six years old, and I remember. And then, of course, at 11, I lost my father. You remember what it was like during World War II, during the Depression years? My mother was on WPA. She was a seamstress, a lady born to a refined family. My father made good money. We had servants in the household. My mother didn't know anything about how to make a living. She could sew and make a doily. She was a real fine seamstress. But she ended up, believe it or not, working for WPA as a seamstress. And I had my paper route and of course, Western Union. But <clears throat> death to me started at a young age. And then in World War II, I never will forget, the USS New Orleans <clears throat> coming alongside the Jamestown. She had had a torpedo hit her just forward of the left, on the left side, her port side just forward of number two barbette. On cruisers, you don't have turrets. You have turrets on battleships. On, I mean, on battleships, <laughs> you have turrets. On cruisers, you have barbettes. It's a French term. But in any extent, everything forward of number two barbette was gone because the torpedo went into the ammunition hole and just had an enormous explosion that went into the barbette and just charred everybody. I was a first class petty officer by that time. And I was told that I had to be on a working party. And I had to go on that ship. And I had to go into these areas and pick these people up. And it wasn't any fun. It's not any fun. So we stacked them up, believe it or not, on an LCVP, a landing vehicle a landing craft like cordwood because we had to get that ship out of there. We gave her water 
And she had lost her generator spaces, so she was losing refrigeration. And she had meat aboard and beer, believe it or not. So we exchanged water for food. And she unloaded all her refrigerated things and we got it food for a change when we were eating rice with beetles in them. Japanese rice that we had taken from the island in Tulagi because our ships were having a rough time supplying us. The end result anyway that I experienced that during World War II, but I was lucky. Went all through World War II and you'd be surprised how many of my friends, I know personal friends that were in school with me that did make it to flight school, but never got their commercial pilot's license because they got it during the war. They died during the war flying airplanes. I know a fellow that went into the submarine service. He didn't make it back home either. But with me, I always had that guardian angel. So I got and got through World War II, God knows how. But then again, to our current day situation, after being married for 47 and a half years to a beautiful lady that I married in Kodiak, Alaska, I romanced her by amateur radio. And the whole West Coast was in on the fact that Johnny was trying to get Doris up to Alaska so that he could marry her. Everybody in the West Coast was doing their best to get what they called foam patches in. I would call down to San Diego where she was in that area and I'd say, I want a foam patch into Long Beach. And they would break their, you know what, to get me connected to her so that I could romance her and get her up to Kodiak. I got her married to me with an easy number to remember so that I would never forget my anniversary on January the 23rd, 1954. Easy. One, two, three, four. Never forgot. Never was blamed for that one. But I was married to her for 47 and a half years. She had a very good friend. Her name was Joanne. I knew the lady, but I did not know of her. Her husband was dying of muscular dystrophy. And they lived two houses from the place where we were renting, right here in Alameda. Because in my excursions from the Apollo, after I left the Apollo, I went to work for Lytton Industries. And from Lytton Industries, they sent me here to the Naval Station, right here, to set up an inertial navigation laboratory in the instrument shop. The contract was for one year. One year. And my job was to work myself out of a job. And I did that by training a civilian who was a GS-12 to take my job over and run the lab. But he used my inertial navigation experience to move on to a GS-13 in another department, leaving a vacancy of nobody able to run the inertial navigation lab for the Navy. So I stayed here another year. And that was canceled four times. Four times they canceled the contract. And I can remember going to the commanding officer one day, and I said, sir, I'm leaving the base. Where are you going? Contract's over with. What do you mean the contract's over with? You're not going anywhere. I don't know what would happen, but only all I know is that I came here for one year and I stayed 13. Okay? I ended up time to retire. From Lytton, I graduated from Lytton by retiring from Lytton. And I elect, I could have gone any place in the world. I had the right to say to the Navy, I want to go here. I could have flown there on the Navy. Lytton would have transferred me any place in the world one time. One time, I was in the contract. And so I called my manager up and I said, I'm ready to retire and I'm ready to move now. I want to get out. Leave, I'm leaving where I'm at and I'm moving to another location. And they figured, oh my God, this man's going to go to Timbuktu. He's going to cost us a million dollars because it costs a lot of money to, to move my stuff around on these assignments. And I said, he said, where are you going? And I said, four blocks. <laughs> four blocks. 
I saved them so much money you could you, you you couldn't believe it. But we were living two houses away from this lady. I'm going to tell you a modern love story, okay? She was my wife's best friend. They were garage sale buddies. And before I forget, don't let me forget about one more story about the Apollo, okay? She used to go with this lady to garage sales. And my wife was an avid reader, as we both were. And she would give this lady all of the literature that she had accumulated over a time period. And I would just deliver them to the front door and she would pick them up. I never said anything to the lady. I'd ring the bell and I'd leave. I knew of her, but I didn't know her, okay? I didn't want to Im impose on that family because the, the man was dying. Ultimately, he passed away. And you know how it is between a man and his wife? All of you have had this conversation. And if you haven't, you better. When you look at each other and you say, you know, if anything happens to me, here's where the insurance policy is. Here's where the mortgage is. Here's where the deed is. Here's, here's this, here's that. And you pass this word on to your wife. Because as far as I was concerned, it was always figured out, I'm going to go first. I was insurance poor. I was going to leave her a rich widow. The only thing I requested was that she didn't run off with a Marine. Okay? She said that, you got a deal. But she said to me, well, you know, if anything happens to me, I want you to call Joanne. It went in one ear and out the other. What do I want to call Joanne? I don't know Joanne. I said, what do I want to call Joanne for? She said, because she just lost her husband and she'll know what you're going through if anything happens to me. On a Monday morning at seven o'clock in the morning, my wife had a massive heart attack. And at seven o'clock that night, she was gone. And I went to Hawaii to be with my mother and my sister. And a little voice said, you better contact Joanne. You better contact Joanne. So I got back to the States right away. And the first thing I did was, I got the magazines that I was supposed to have delivered before I went to Hawaii. And I took them and I rang the bell. And she expected to me, seeing me get in my car, which was usually the case. I'd wave at her and leave only to see that I was still there when she opened up the door. And I said, I've got bad news. She knew that I had cancer. Not this one, I had prostate cancer. And I had gone through radiation and treatment for that. She figured, oh my God, the cancer has come back. The lady was an avid trotter. She walked every morning. She walked three miles from one end of the island all the way to the other end of the island on Shoreline Drive every morning. She and her husband taught ballroom dancing for 40 years for the Alameda Uni Unified, uh, I mean the uh, Recreation Department. She taught at Mastic Senior Center. And she, I said to her, I got bad news. She says, come on in, let's talk about it. Because she figured I was getting ready to tell her the bad news about my prostate cancer. This was later. I said to her, Doris has passed away. She couldn't believe it. She didn't know it because the signal between Doris and her was to draw the drapes open. It was my signal, I mean her signal to Joanne, I'm hope home and you can visit. Wallace is not here. You can visit, <laughs> okay? She didn't ever come there while I was there. She didn't want to, she was that kind of a person. Very, very reserved. And so she had fallen and hurt her knee and had, had surgery on her knee and she did not see it in the obituary because the very day that she elected to have one newspaper less than what she would normally get for a week's time and save a little bit of money, the obituary came out and she missed it. She wasn't going up and down on her morning walk, so she didn't see the drapes being drawn. So she did not know that Joanne had passed away. The end result was that she said, well, what are you going to do? 
And I said, well, you know, I've always thought it would be nice to buy myself a pair of patent leather shoes, get myself a nice tuxedo, get out there on one of these princess lines and romance the devil out of some of these widows that are out there who want to dance all over the place. I said, I think that would be nice. And so I'm going to go to Arthur Mary and learn how to dance. I'm halfway decent with the waltz and the foxtrot, but I want to really polish it up. She says, don't do that. I can't help you right now because I've got a cast on my leg, but I can take you to Mastic. I teach ballroom dancing and have done it for 40 years with my husband. I'll teach you how to dance. You don't have to pay, spend any money with, with Arthur Mary. So I said, that's a good deal. She took me to Mastic, introduced me to all kinds of nice ladies, and sure enough, I danced all over the place for I don't know how long until her, ladies, her knees got squared away and she made me her partner and I was her dance instructing partner for 10 years. Okay? And that was a modern day romance. I ended up taking care of her. Vicky was her caregiver. She took care of her in the daytime. I took care of her at night. In November the 15th of this last year, at age 96, my true love passed away. And I miss her, miss her terribly. I loved my first wife dearly. But you can love another person. It's a different love, but it's just as intense, just as intense and just as beautiful. And now I'm alone, I have Vicki. And I'm trying to cope with what I have to con confront. Let's go back to death again, because that's been very important to me. And I'm on the Apollo, and we're having a test. It's Apollo 1, Grissom, Chaffee, and White. I'm sure you've seen the picture of the guy that's out in space in a white, un white suit, space suit. That's Ed White. He was a big guy, football player type, very strong. We had an argument with the NASA. They wanted a redundancy system because they feared that if we lost pressure in that capsule, we would lose our men. So we want to have a two hatch system. We want the hatch on the outside to open to the outside. We want a hatch on the inside to open to the inside. And when the pressure on the inside of the cabin sealing against the inside hatch, making sure that you were having a seal, if you see what I'm saying, ensuring that you would never be emergency-wise decompressed. They were having a test. And all of a sudden we get a communications. Get us out of here, we got a fire. We had done something that was a big mistake. We had gone to 100% pure oxygen. Those of you who know anything about combustion knows that you can take anything. You can take this bottle with water in it. And if you supersaturate it with oxygen, just put a match to it and it burns like a torch. And there was a spark in the lower bay of the Apollo which in 20 seconds, in 20 seconds, build up a sufficient pressure inside the capsule that it actually ruptured the capsule. The seam of the thing actually ruptured. The internal pressure was so high. The job of Ed White, the center, center couch, was to get out of his house, reach up to the hatch, undog it, lift it out, put it underneath his seat, open the outside hatch and get out of there. An evacuation procedure that they did over and over and over again. Doesn't take long to do it. But you didn't have an internal pressure of God knows how many pounds per square inch pushing that inner hatch up against the seal. And Superman would not have been able to reach up there and pull that off. They didn't have a chance. Thank God studies show that it, they did not suffer. 
They died of asphyxiation because they had so much Velcro in there that they proved, for instance, that there was so much Velcro that the Velcro just it was like a torch. And uh, unfortunately, they died. They calculated they didn't last but about 20 or 25 seconds before they lost consciousness. So they didn't suffer. It took them six hours to get those guys out of there because the Velcro and the couches had melted and had become part of them. So I experienced this, not that I had anything to do with lifting the bodies out of there, but I was there when it happened. So I've had my share of death in more ways than one. And now at 93, the days are getting short. And I know it. I'm living with a condition that can come up tomorrow. I have a PET scan about every six months. And what they're doing is looking for the possibilities that my cancer may come back because it's there. All of us have a touch of it, whether you realize it or not. And I've got it. So it could hit me any moment. I could go in and have a PET scan and they'll say, I'm sorry, I had to tell you this, but it has metastasized now to one of your organs and it's just a matter of time. But guys, from the minute that we're born, we begin to die. Dying is just part of living. And I have accepted it. I'm very pragmatic about it. I'm not worried about it. I've got all kinds of ideas as to what's gonna happen. And I can expound on that by the hour, which I do at times, but I'm not worried about it. In fact, I'm not in a hurry, but I'm sort of looking forward to it. You know why? Because I think it's gonna be an education and I'm gonna learn something else. You see, I believe that we're here to learn a lesson. And we matriculate through the system and you either learn it or you gotta do it over again. It's just as simple as that. In what form you have to do it over again? All kinds of theories on that. You know, reincarnation, whatever. But I do believe that you gotta graduate, guys. Every day you should look at it as your last one. Because for a lot of people, today is the last one. And they don't know it. And it doesn't make whether it doesn't make any difference if you're six months old or six hundred years old. It doesn't make any difference. Every day you want to live it up for all it's worth. Above all, love each other. No greater word was ever thought of than the word love. And it has many ramifications as to what it means. My story, my life has been not only a love story, it's been an education and it's been fun. And I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to the next one. I wanna thank all of you for putting up your indulgence and putting up with my rambling, as it were, because I have a tendency to do this from time to time. I forget my purpose because I get all involved. But it's been fun, and I hope you invite me back. Thank you very much.